We are presently in a series on prayer, in particular the Lord's Prayer. The title of this series is, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And we have already talked about those elements of the prayer that have to do with preparation. That is, who we are addressing and where He lives and who He is. And we come to this first one was His person. We say, Our Father. And that's His person. That's who we are talking to. And we talked about who God is. Then the part that says, Who art in heaven, that's His place. God occupies the throne of heaven. And when we pray, we're praying toward heaven. We're praying toward a supernatural place where a supernatural being exists that created everything that is. So we talked about heaven and how wonderful it is. Well, this morning we're going to talk about that part of the prayer where he says, Hallowed be thy name. And that is his position. That is who God actually is. What position does God occupy? Now, of course, we know that God occupies the highest position that there is. There is none higher than God. And so when we come to the time to pray, and when we pray, we want to know and we want to be aware and reminded that we are praying to the Almighty God. We are praying to one who occupies the highest position there is. So when we pray to God, we're not asking for an opinion. We're asking for a final decree. We're asking for ultimate truth, ultimate justice. We're asking God to answer our prayers that we have made, but according to His ultimate perfect will. So let's talk about His position, hallowed be thy name. Now when Jesus gave us this model prayer, He, he gave it to us so that we could pray properly. Uh, other times Jesus told His disciples uh, gave examples of how not to pray. Don't just repeat the same prayer over and over, thinking if you say it enough uh, that it'll happen. And, and don't pray long prayers so others can see you pray long prayers. Uh, he, he said to pray with the right attitude. But here he's using a formula to tell us how, when we pray, that we can have the right feeling and knowledge in our heart. So he said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That part of his model prayer means something. That part of this model prayer places us in a position that is under God, that places him high. Now the word hallowed in the Bible comes from the Greek word hagiazo, which means to make holy. And that is uh, ceremonially, ceremonially to purify or consecrate or to mentally to venerate God. So it's a worship term. Other words mean to uh, be holy, to sanctify, uh, his name is hallowed, uh, that he's set apart, he's consecrated, uh, other than is a, is a word that comes to mind, a phrase, uh, special, revered, highly esteemed. So Jesus instructs us to pray with the right attitude toward the Father. Our attitude toward him makes our prayer uh, effective. Now, we have uh, understandings in just human relationships. Uh, if, if you want something from, say, your earthly father, uh, it's best to show your earthly father a degree of respect, is it not? You don't just go up to him and say, hey, old man, uh, uh, I'd like to have thus and such. No, but if you say, dad, thou bring her home of the bacon, thou sit her in the easy chair, uh, thou tallest in the house. Uh, you, you, you say things that maybe makes him realize that you know who he is. He's dad, you know. And uh, you, you refer to him in respectful ways. He's more likely to listen to what you uh, have to say and more likely to give you what you want. Well, that's just an earthly description. But listen, when we come to the ultimate father, should we be any less respectful? Should we be any less understanding that we want to come to the God who exists, who actually is there? And so that his name is hallowed. So we are coming to the Lord with the right attitude. That's what Jesus is teaching us, that when we pray, we pray like this. Now, just, you know, when we say our Father and we say, hallowed be thy name, it's good to say it. It's good to say something that's like that. But it, I think it's more important uh, to mean it. It's like, you know, saying to your wife, I love you. Well, you can say that and it's good to say it, but it's really good to mean it when you say it. When we come to the Lord and we say, hallowed be thy name, there should be a sense of that. There should be an overwhelming reality that we're talking to one who is holy. We're talking to one who is God, who is divine. 
Uh, and so we want to look at some reasons why it is important to have that as part of our prayer, to have an acknowledgement of who God is and a, a praise time for Him. First of all, let's look at the instruction of it, that the Scriptures teach and prescribe a proper handling of God's name. Hallowed be thy name. The name of God was given uh, in a special way, and it is important. Uh, the third commandment uh, says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now this means more than one thing. Uh, it means that we should not just throw God's name around flippantly. It certainly means we should not use God's name in blasphemy and swearing and profanity. Uh, but it also means that when we speak to God, we should not be uh, disattached. We should not be detached from the awareness that He is God. If we say, Lord, but we don't mean Lord, are we taking His name in vain? If we say Heavenly Father, but we don't really understand and comprehend what we're saying when we say Heavenly Father, or are we taking His name in vain? To some degree, I think it's possible to do that. Because vain means empty, meaningless. Uh, and so there are minor ways in which we can take the Lord's name in vain, and major ways in which we can take the Lord's name in vain. However we use the name of the Lord, we don't want it to be counterproductive. We want it to be productive. And so there is the commandment to honor and revere the name of the Lord. His name is above every name. His name is not ordinary. His name is special. Also, the worship formula, and I, I like to look at Psalm 40, ver verse 16, as just a reference to a worship formula that David used over and over, and we find it's thematic all through the Word of God. In Psalm 40, verse 16, let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Now, what the psalmist is saying is that it ought to be our constant understanding and our constant practice to magnify the name of the Lord. Now, by the way, we're never going to overdo this. We're never going to make God bigger than He deserves to be. We're never going to get an understanding of the greatness of God that exceeds His greatness. We're never going to overdo it when it comes to magnifying the name of the Lord. He surpasses the capacity that we have to do so. So when we reach to God, we are reaching. We are reaching up to Him, and we are reaching up to Him, which means hallowed be thy name. It is an important part of the Lord's Prayer. It's why He included it and why He gave it as part of the formula for how we should pray. Now, we talked about the instruction. Let's think about the examples. All through the Bible, there's examples for good and for bad when it comes to how one relates properly to God. And I think of Abraham. Abraham is an example. Uh, Abraham uh, listened to God. When God spoke, he listened. When God said, do something, he obeyed. Uh, he left a, a great city. Uh, apparently, from what we know about Abraham, uh, he came from a, a well-to-do family. Uh, they were ones that had uh, caravans, and they went back and forth, uh, similar to what we would have today in the shipping industry, except with camels. Uh, and he had a standing army. He was known to be very rich. And so Abraham left that city to become a wanderer in the land of promise. And he listened to God, and he revered God's name. I think also of Moses. When God spoke to Moses, he listened and he obeyed. He took off his shoes because the place was holy ground. Uh, listen, when he met with God, he understood that God was special. I think of David. You look all through the Psalms and all through the life of David. Uh, David held God in awe. When he came to God, he came to a God that he, listen, he could not even understand how someone as great as God would even pay attention to a little speck like himself. He understood who God really was. And Isaiah Isaiah says that I saw the Lord high and lifted up and he saw the angels that were about the throne of God and they, they cried, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Here Isaiah understood the greatness and the magnitude of God and who he was and they all were humble before him. Well, there's some negative examples too. There's plenty of them in the Bible. You think of Pharaoh. 
Now, Pharaoh uh, took upon himself to get in a contest, not with Moses. Moses was just a spokesman. Pharaoh wasn't in a contest with Moses. Pharaoh was in a contest with God. And he would not kneel. He would not obey. He hardened his heart to God. And so, as you know, plague after plague after plague came upon them, and he kept hardening his heart against it. And even after he relented and let them go, he changed his mind and chased after them and tried to capture them and bring them back. And I know, of course, what the Word of God says, that the Red Sea closed in on him and all his army, and they were gone. Listen, Pharaoh is an example, a negative example, of how not to view God. And then there was, of course, Goliath. Goliath cursed the God of the Israelites, and he used blasphemy, and he challenged them to come out and fight him. And they were listening, hiding, quivering in fear, and here comes David. Now let's understand, David had been worshiping God. David knew the scriptures. He knew that that the Bible says, one of you shall chase ten, and ten of you shall chase a thousand. God had blessed David with physical strength and courage. He killed a lion to protect the sheep. He killed a bear to protect the sheep. And he heard that guy mouthing off, And he basically said, isn't anybody going to take him out? Is anybody going to challenge him? And he looked around, nobody. He said, well, I'll do it. Now, what what puts it into the heart of a teenage boy to go and take on a blasphemer? It's because he had an understanding of God, and he had an understanding of the Word, and God had given him a special anointing to be that champion that day. Now, you think about he ran toward him with that sling and that stone. And you know why Goliath was so surprised when that stone hit him? Because nothing had ever entered his mind like that before. I, I couldn't pass that one up, folks. Had to. Okay. Now, the, the idea is that Goliath is a negative example of how to refer to the name of God. Then you think of Jezebel. We have to put a woman in here because men aren't the only ones that have a, a bad understanding of God. Jezebel became uh, with Ahab the co-regent and she was from a, a royal house and she thought when she came into Israel she'd be able to make decisions and she did. She ran Ahab around like he was a henpecked husband and on her own had killed priests and tried to eradicate the worship of Jehovah God and she was going to bring paganism and this uh, fertility cult into the country and kill anybody that wouldn't go along with it. And uh, so we know that eventually she met her doom. And then there's an interesting one. I just want us to go and look at this one in particular, a man named Rab Shaka. Rab Shaka. Now you may not have that name where it rolls off the tongue, but turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to see some words from King Rab Shaka uh, concerning the God of Israel. 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 28. Now, Rabshakeh was in a siege operation against Jerusalem, and he was uh, a mighty warrior. He had conquered uh, many nations round about. And so he put a propaganda campaign speaking in the Jews' language so that they would hear him. And in in, uh, chapter 18, verse 28, we find this. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me. And then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his own fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his cistern. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that you may live and not die. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of thine, mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand? Now listen, can you imagine what it was like for the king of Israel to have to listen to that and to have to uh, endure this and then the, the, to, to have to calm his people down? So he took this and he, he, he brought it to the Lord 
and the Lord worked a great victory, and Rabshakeh was defeated and sent away, and the Lord did deliver. Now, there are instances after instance where uh, God's name was challenged and blasphemed, and the person who did it ended up uh, being punished for it, and we see that throughout history. Uh, modern blasphemers, uh, people whose names we may know uh, from literature, Voltaire, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, uh, David Hume, uh, Carl Sagan. Uh, Carl Sagan was known to say the cosmos is all there is and all there ever was and all there ever will be. He was an atheist, didn't believe in God. Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer, atheist. John Lennon uh, took his pokes at God and took his pokes at Jesus Christ. Richard Dawkins, and uh, one of those that, that is uh, very popular today, Bill Maher. Uh, now, I have a, a kind of a, a thing about Bill Maher. I want to like the guy because he at least has some common sense at times and seems to be honest in some ways, but he is an atheist, doesn't believe in God, makes fun of religion, uh, makes jokes about it. This is blasphemy. One thing he said about God one time, he said it must be a, a very egotistical God that has to be worshipped all the time. And I thought, I shuddered when I heard that, and I thought, no, no, it must be a mighty egotistical person that can fail to fall on his knees before a holy God. Uh, listen, when we understand God is not like us, God, God isn't just another guy. He's not just another dude. Uh, God is in heaven. His name is hallowed. And listen, when we come to God, we come to God. Now, let, let me explain this. If we were in a courtroom and we had our life in the balance because of a judge that sits there with that black robe behind a counter. And we were to approach him and give reasons why he should not bring the hammer down on us. I don't think we'd say something like, well, Chuck, it's like this. Or Billy, let me tell you what I think. You know, you know what they say in court? You know what they say. Your honor. Your honor. And that goes back to England, it goes back to Europe, but listen, when, when you're talking to somebody in a position of power, you recognize that power. They have that. They have that authority. You say, your honor, I would like to speak for myself. You don't call him by his nickname. Okay, now when we come to God, we come to a holy God. And, and we can't come to God unless we worship, because that's how he's approached. We can't come to God without a humble heart and without revering His name because the only way we can get into His presence is to be affected by His presence. And if we're not affected by His presence, we're not in His presence. Everyone who ever found themselves in the presence of God, it had a powerful effect upon them. Sometimes it was so powerful that all they could do is lay down on the ground on their face and feel totally helpless and totally weak. There were times when Daniel, the great prophet of God, was so uh, out of, of, of his ability to do anything, he said, I can't even move. And he had to have an angel come to strengthen him. We, we find that Solomon, when he met God, he said, I'm a child and no man. Uh, Job said, I'm a worm and no man. Uh, you think about when you're in the presence of God, you cannot feel anything except small. So someone who can say that God must be egotistical to be, need to be worshipped, let me think, let me just say this. God doesn't need your praise. God doesn't need your approval. God's not up there in heaven saying, oh, if I only had people had a better opinion of me. God is not suffering from a minority complex. Uh, God is not suffering from low ego. God knows who he is, and he knows that the only way he can benefit you is for you to know who he is and come to him with the right attitude. That's why Jesus, who was God in the flesh, said, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Jesus wanted our prayers to work. He wanted our prayer life to have power and meaning. And so it is important. And this brings us to the exhortation to honor God's name. There are reasons why it's important. First of all, and we've touched on it, but it's by warning by warning, because to fail to do it is a dangerous thing. He is the eternal judge. He has the divine authority to, pu to punish blasphemy. 
You think about this. It just is, uh, we are warned all through Scripture uh, to treat the, the name of God and to treat God with reverence and respect. Uh, he will punish blasphemy, and he has demonstrated his willingness to curse individuals who blaspheme. Blaspheming God is a dangerous, dangerous sin. Now, let me just touch upon this. There are many people who have blasphemed God, who have repented and become saved and are on their way to heaven. The Apostle Paul himself was a blasphemer for a period of time. He blasphemed the name of Christ and he even compelled others to blaspheme, which means he put them to some form of torture or compulsion to renounce the name of Jesus. Now, let me ask you, what is more egotistical than forcing someone to agree with you about something? What is more egotistical than using physical means and even pain uh, and torture and, and, and threat of death to get someone else to agree with you about a certain thing? What is more egotistical than uh, forcing someone to agree with you or they lose their job or they lose their freedom or they lose their money? That's what people do. But listen, God knows what's right and he knows what's good for us and he will punish blasphemy. But in this exhortation, it's not just by warning, but it's, it's just reason, by reason, common sense, we could say. Let's give some reasons. For example, we should hallow the name of God, first of all, because he is big. He is big. And when I say big, uh, that's a capital B, capital I, capital G with, with a trillion exclamation marks behind it. And then we run out of zeros. He is big, big. Now, someone who is that big, we ought to be in awe of. Have you ever been around somebody, uh, just a person who is just impressive to be around? Maybe it was their physical size. I've been around some people who were just so big and so muscular and so strong, I felt kind of wimpish around them. I thought, wow, that guy's really big. And I've been around some other people whose intellect was so keen and whose mind was so sharp, and I was impressed with that. I've seen people who had talents and skills that I was amazed at, and I thought, wow, I'm in the presence of something special. I once saw a Chinese acrobat on a six-foot uh, unicycle, uh, keeping herself balanced with one leg and catching plates that were thrown to her on one foot and throwing them up on the, in the air and landing them on her head over and over again. I couldn't believe, and I was, I was there in person. I was watching it. It wasn't a film. I was there. I watched this girl do this, and they put two plates on, and the two plates would do flips in the air and land on her head. Three plates, she would kick it while doing the unicycle, and I thought, I can't even put my pants on without falling over. And, and, and here's, this, here's this young lady who, who has such skill. And the only thing that, that would have been more impressive than what I was seeing is if she began to levitate and fly around the room. That would have been more impressive, but only slightly more so than what I was watching. Uh, to be impressed with someone who is so far beyond anything that you can comprehend, it's, it's awe-inspiring. But nothing that any human being could be or say or do begins to compare with God. He is big. He is also wise. He's wise. God knows stuff. He knows it all. And he has known it all the time. And he knows it now. And he always will know it. There is no being that can be compared with God. On top of that, he is good. He's good. Listen, I'm comforted to know that we have a good God. He is good. He is the standard of righteousness. He is the standard of good. Anything that is godly is good. Anything that is ungodly is bad. God is good. And we're thankful that God is forgiving. That's the, listen, that's the only way that any of us can have a relationship with God is because He's forgiving if God were not forgiving, none of us could have a relationship with God because there would always be something in the way. We couldn't reconcile. We need to be reconciled in order to have a relationship with God. And so He is forgiving. And then finally, He is worthy. Worthy. You know, the very word worship comes from the word worthy. When we worship God, 
we are with different forms and with different expressions, we are saying you are worthy. You are worthy. That is, He is special, He is great, He is holy, He deserves our praise. Why? Because He is worthy of all of these things. He is God. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, let's look at that. Revelation 4, 11. And this is what we find in heaven. This is how heaven views uh, God. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, when we understand what the word Lord means, it helps us to understand the hallowed name of God. Lord implies two things. It implies ownership, as in the case of landlord. He owns the house. He's your landlord. He is Lord. He owns everything. And Lord also means that He is ruler. So He owns everything. He is the authority over everything. He is Lord. And so when we come to the Lord, we're coming to the one who is hallowed. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, power. He's created all things. And they were made for Him. And we ought to reflect that and respect that. You think about what heaven is like. Heaven is filled with the praise of God. Heaven is filled with hallowing God's name. Now, I think one of the best things we can do, perhaps the best thing that we can do, is, is when we reflect heaven here. When we are here like heaven is. Now, the closest thing we can get to that is when we worship. Because when we worship, we're doing like they do in heaven. When we worship God, we're agreeing with heaven. When we magnify His name, we are agreeing with those who are in heaven beholding His face even now. When we say, thank you, Lord, we are expressing gratitude to the one that people in heaven are grateful to. When we say, Lord, your name is high, we are reflecting what the people in heaven know when they see that God is high. When we say, you're holy, they know he's holy. When we say, Lord, you're good, they see he's good. We ought to be, listen, we ought to be in agreement with heaven. We ought to be acting like the people act in heaven. Now, we're far from being able to do that as they do because we have so much sin in the way. We have so much of our fallen nature. But the closest we can get is when we pray. The closest we can get is when we sing hymns to the Lord and songs to the Lord. The closest when we get is when we meet together in a church like this and we focus our attention on the things of God and we open up our hearts and souls. That's important to live a heavenly life. Why? Because this earth is a mess. We need to bring heaven down. Listen, hell is ruling in this earth. Do you realize that? The forces of, of Satan and his demons are ruling in this world. He is called the God of this world for a reason. He is called the prince of the power of the air for a reason. He is called the spirit that rules in the hearts of the children of disobedience for a reason. When Jesus was tempted uh, for those days, one of the temptations that Satan put on him was he said, Jesus, if, if you will bow down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth for they are given to me and I can give them to whosoever I will. Now, I challenge you in your theology to, to parse that out and to understand it. I can't help but see it. What it means is that they belong to him. He owns them. He's running it. Listen, all Jesus would, would have had to say is, you don't own them. You don't have them. You can't give them to whoever you want. Jesus did not even contest his claim to have the kingdoms and be able to give them to them. Now, what if I went out here to the parking lot and I found uh, Brother Andy's car. And I said, uh, I said to uh, perhaps Eric here, I said, Eric, I'm going to give you this car. It's yours. I can give it to whoever I want. Well, if Andy's around, he might say, well, no, I take issue with that. I've got the pink slip on that car. You don't have the right to give away my car. Now, wouldn't that make sense? Of course, I don't have the right to give away somebody else's possession. Satan offered Jesus the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Think about it. 
Heaven does not rule in this earth. Heaven limits the rule of Satan on this earth, yes. But heaven does not rule completely on this earth. Tell Dr. Bottle Stopper he's wrong. Tell the televangelists they're wrong. You're not going to have prosperity in the kingdom now. It's in our hearts. We are citizens of heaven living in the hell house. We are citizens of heaven living in a place where Satan is holding great sway. Now that's why we've been praying. Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The reason we're praying it is because it hadn't happened yet. We're wanting it to happen and we're waiting for it to happen and we're longing for it to happen. But until then, there's a different kingdom that's running this place. And there's a different reality that's going. So listen, when we pray, hallowed be thy name. We're, ne- we're making a connection to the heavenly Father who lives in heaven and who has a holy name. When we pray, we must pray to the true God. And the only God that exists is the one who is high and hallowed. This one true God is someone that we pray to. He is not a genie who, if you rub the lamp just right, he'll give you your three wishes. He's not a bellhop that stands behind a counter and says, what can I do for you today? He is the king of the universe who sits on a throne. And when we come to the throne of grace, here's what we do. We ask. We ask. And that means that when he hears, he answers according to his holy will. There's a story about a, uh, an older preacher who was uh, having a younger man to come up and, and, and lead in prayer. And so as sometimes they had, the preacher was on the platform. He's an older white-haired gentleman. And a young, young man, ministerial student, got up and began to go on and on in his prayer. And he used all these theological language and and he was just waxing eloquent with all of these fancy seminary words. And, and so the, the minister got tired of listening to this. And so he went up and tapped him on the shoulder. And he says, call him father and ask him for something. Now see, this man had understood what prayer is. Call him father and ask him for something. Now, that's basically what Jesus is saying, except he made it clear that we're praying to the Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When we pray, let's make sure in our minds and hearts, let's exercise this. We don't necessarily have to say, hallowed be thy name, but we ought to be able to express in some way the fact that we recognize who he is and that he's great and he's holy and he's good and we love him. Dear Father, I pray that you'd help us to pray more often, help us to pray more effectively. Lord, help us to take this pattern prayer that Jesus gave us as an example of how to pray effectively, how to pray properly, Lord, and apply it to our lives in a, in a better, more efficient way. For it's in Jesus' name we ask, amen. Amen. God bless. Well, let's stand together and we'll sing.